Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am uh, Skip Rutherford, Dean of the uh, University of Arkansas Clinton School of Public Service, uh, and welcome tonight to a great presentation on a book that I uh, have thoroughly enjoyed reading and still want to know more about. I want to thank Nikolai De Pippa of the Clinton School for coordinating this program, and I want to thank David Hill, the author of The Vapors, uh, for being with us. Uh, again, I'm looking forward to this program. Uh, I love this book. Uh, I think it reflects Arkansas's fiber, its fabric, its character, uh, and I learned a lot, and I look forward to learning more. To moderate the program is my friend Lindsay Miller, the editor of the Arkansas Times and the founder of the Arkansas Nonprofit News Network. So, Lindsay, thank you for being here. David, thank you. Uh, let's enjoy this program. Thanks, Skip. I'm thrilled to be here. Let me introduce uh, David a little bit more. So he is the author of the, Vap the Vapors, A Southern Family, The New York Mob, and The Rise and Fall of Hot Springs, Americans, America's Forgotten Capital of Vice. He's contributed to This American Life, New York Magazine, The New Yorker, The New York Times, GQ, McSweeney's, and The Ringer. He received the Sydney Award for Outstanding Journalism from the Hillman Foundation for a feature, a feature he wrote for The Ringer called In the Pit, with the fighting rooster about cockfighting. He's also the vice president of the National Writers Union. He and his wife and three children live in New York. So welcome, David. Hey, thanks. That, that piece was about Arkansas too, you know, that, that cockfighting story. Yeah, everybody should check it out. Um, so your, your book tells the story of the rise and fall of Hot Springs as a gambling mecca over a roughly 30 year period from the early 1930s to the, the early 1960s. It's, it's a sweeping narrative with many players, but you focus on three characters. Uh, Oni Madden, the New York mob boss who retired uh, to Hot Springs after he was released from prison in 1933. Dane Harris, the longtime Hot Springs casino boss uh, and the owner of the Vapors nightclub and casino uh, from which of course your book draws its name. And then your grandmother, Hazel Hill, uh, who lived in Hot Springs during this time and was a bit player in the casino story. You know, I, I love the book, but I was initially skeptical of her story getting equal prominence. But by the end, it was one of my favorite parts. Was it obvious to you from the beginning that she would be central in the book? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know how much, I mean, yeah, it was obvious that, it, that I, I, I kind of, decided on this structure pretty early on about how I wanted to write it. The, the decision to include Hazel's story was kind of twofold. I mean, originally I just felt like I needed some kind of personal entry into telling the story, right? I had, um, I, I'm not a historian and I'm not like a, um, you know, I'm not a, like, I don't, I'm not an academic or whatever. I, I, I felt like I would have a hard time writing kind of a scholarly history of Hot Springs, Arkansas. And also, honestly, it's not the book I wanted to write. So having kind of a personal entry into it would have allowed me to kind of, you know, treat this story in more like memoir. Um, but, uh, but I didn't come from a family that was like, you know, really connected to, you know, the, uh, it weren't, they weren't like that important in the history of Hot Springs. But in the end, I feel like that was good because I think Hazel and her story ends up serving as like, I mean, she serves as kind of this avatar for like the everyday regular, you know, person in Hot Springs, the kind of working class folks who pushed the brooms and carried the trays and dealt the cards and, and were impacted by all the decisions that the powerful people like Oni and Dane made. And to me, that was important to make sure that those, that those stories kind of, um, kind of carried uh, equal weight. It was difficult to figure out how to weave them all together, but as I got to writing, it ended up not being that tough when I realized like, oh, what I'm writing towards is the vapors, right? This club where they'll all meet. And um, that made it a lot, that made it all kind of click in my head. What about personally, you know, writing about family can be fraught. Um, you, yeah. you know, you include a lot of, a lot of highs, but a whole lot of lows. Yeah. Um, was that something that you felt like you had to clear with relatives before you delved into it? Or did you just say, hey, this is my grandmother. I'm gonna tell her story however I want. No, it was really difficult. Um, and uh, honestly, I mean, for a lot of Hazel stories, I, I um, in the beginning I had interviewed, um, I did a lot of interviews with Ressie, who was one of the um, last surviving um, members of sort of Hollis's generation. And, um, 
and uh, she was really getting up there in years and she was very protective of Hazel when I was interviewing her, right? So I kind of got one version of stories from her where it was clear that she was trying really hard to like protect me, I think, maybe protect Hazel, but you know, she was, she was definitely not getting into some of the like, you know, uh, nitty gritty details about some of the more tragic and, and, and uh, parts of Hazel's story. But I also interviewed my uncle, Larry, who's still uh, alive, and he, um, and I spent, you know, many, many hours uh, with him, interviewing him about some of these stories, and I kind of got another version of the stories from him, right, where he was much more candid and forthcoming, and, um, and he told me from the very beginning, he was like, look, I'm going to give you the, the full picture of her, right, like, I, I'm critical, he, I think he's, like, more critical of some of the decisions she made, and I think he wanted me to know, like, I'm going to tell you the whole story. And I wanted the whole story, right? I didn't want anybody to blow sunshine up my ass about what had happened. I wanted to get, you know, take the full measure of her life when I told the story. And I felt like it was important for me to have that so that I could try to, you know, write it in a way that was, you know, balanced and nuanced or whatever. It was difficult. I mean, my, my relationship to my grandmother kind of changed while writing this book, but my opinion of her and my thoughts about her became very complicated by the end. So even for me, it was difficult. So, but I did try to, you know, we, not just with her, but with everybody in the book, even, you know, even with people from, you know, even with Oni and with Dane and his family, I tried as hard as I could to like, you know, uh, handle these people with care because these are real people in their real lives. And I was always trying to be mindful of like how this would, how some of these things would read and what, what was gratuitous and what was necessary in order to tell the story. So how old were you when, when your grandmother died? How, what was your relationship like with her? I think I was 13. Um, she, uh, I had a close relationship with her. I mean, I, um, when I was a kid, you know, she used to look after me, uh, from, you know, she'd often look after us when our parents were working or whatever. And, um, so I grew up around her and, you know, and after the book ends, you know, into the book, you know, she gets with this carnival man. Right. And so and goes on the road with him and she ends up staying with him. And, you know, when I was a kid, he was kind of like my grandfather, right? Like he was the grandfather figure in my life. And, um, so I got to know him and her fairly well as a kid. Um, and, you know, she lived in a little old trailer down on Central Avenue. And, um, and I had a lot of fond memories of, uh, of, of her when I was a kid. And, and, and you know, and they definitely told stories. And I had some sense of, like, what her life was like. You know, obviously not all of it. But I definitely felt like, you know, I could sense that there was something cool about, like, their past, you know, because she and he were both, like, they, even after the events of this book, I mean, you know, there's, I wish that I could kept writing all the way into the 70s because her life gets pretty wild in the 70s when she's on the road with the carnival. And, and I wrote this piece for Grantland in, uh, years ago. The first piece I ever wrote for them was about her and him and about uh, a murder and a fixed horse race. And all, so folks should go and read that. If you want to get some more Hazel Hill content, go check out The Invaders at Grantland. I wrote a whole story about her that takes place in the early 80s. But, but um, you know, I could tell when I was a kid even that like there was some sort of like you know, there was this, there was some glamour back in the past in Hot Springs, right? Where there was just like matchbooks laying around or like old poker chips or whatever, or just the stories. I mean, I could tell that like, there was something kind of interesting and neat about, about the past uh, that I got, you know, that I kind of picked up on around Hazel. Well, so I, I assume that this book was something that had been gestating for a long time, you know, since you became a professional writer, but I've heard you say elsewhere that that, that wasn't the case. So Where'd the book come from? So I wrote this story um, I think for Grantland about um, people cheating at bass fishing tournaments. And, um, and the story was, you know, after I wrote that story, I got a lot of invitations to like meet and have lunches with like editors and agents and stuff like that. And, uh, and so it was sort of during that period of time that people really started, it was the first time everybody, anybody really ever asked me to write a book was after I wrote that story. And, um, and so, I started pitching ideas for books to people. And this was kind of an idea that had been lingering in the back of my head, but I'd never really done anything with it. Cause like I said, nobody had really ever asked me to write a book before. And I had this feeling that I wanted to write about hot springs because I wrote that piece for Grantland, you know, about um, Hazel called the invaders. And the reaction to that piece was like, you know, people were, I mean, you know, people thought it was a, a nice piece, but mostly people were like, what is this town that I've never heard of? Why do I not know this story? Right. And that surprised me because I grew up, 
in Hot Springs and I took for granted how much people actually knew about some of this stuff, right? But then I was, when I wrote the piece for Grandland, I realized like, wow, nobody knows this story, right? Outside of a small radius, this is really an untold story. And so that's, I think the very beginning of me thinking like, well, somebody ought to write this, right? Somebody needs to tell the story. And it, you know, after a few years, I realized, well, I ought to write it. Like nobody else is going to, no one else is going to come along and do it. So I'll, I'll do it. And so that's sort of how it all came together. So as a journalist who specializes in writing narratives, uh, writing narrative feature stories, your subject matter is, is often about gambling. Um, you write semi regularly for the ringer, uh, most mm -hmm. lately about gambling and then the coronavirus and a cheating scandal that blew, blew up uh, the poker community, in the poker community. Um, you know, Hot Springs heyday uh, was long past when you were growing up. Yeah. Uh, and, and in the 80s and Oakland wouldn't get uh, electronic games of skill until 2005 when you were long gone. So, I mean, you've, you've touched on this a little bit, but what did you know about the, the, the culture and gambling? I mean, were you, did you grow up steeped in gambling lore? Was yeah, it a I mean, in your family? Yeah. I mean, just because like the, you know, just because the dice tables kind of left the casino floors in Hot Springs, the gamblers never left, right? I mean, the community, I think, still was filled with all kinds of, you know, gamblers and rascals. And even when I was a kid, I mean, and Oaklawn was still a major part of the culture and the community in Hot Springs, right? I mean, the Hot Springs economy, when I was growing up, revolved around the race meet because, you know, back in the 80s, people had to travel with their horse races, right? They didn't have simulcasts and all, that kind of thing where you could watch the races from wherever. Like if you wanted to bet on a horse run at Oaklawn, you either bet with a bookie or you had to be at Oaklawn betting on it. And so a lot of people who loved horse racing would travel the circuit, so to speak. And so a lot of tourists came to Hot Springs even into the 1980s and the city really you know, revolved around that time of year. And so in that sense, the whole community was kind of like, you know, gambling had a different feel and a different kind of, um, you know, there wasn't as much of a stigma attached around it because so many people's livelihoods depended on people coming to town to bet on horse races. And it also brought gamblers to town. And, and I think so, even as a kid, I was very aware of this culture. You know, obviously the family I come from, it was a part of our life as well. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I, would, I think that, you know, that back then anyway, it was hard to be from Hot Springs and not have some sense of that, that world, you know? Yeah. So are, are you, I mean, did, do you also gamble? Are you interested? Is this a sort of write what you know uh, situation? <laughs> I do like gambling. You know, one of the things I've said is that, you know, my father, you know, who's in the book, right. He's uh he was, um, he and I couldn't have been any more different, right? I mean, he liked to hunt and fish and he played football and he was, you know, he built houses and he was, uh, and he was kind of this, you know, big, tough redneck who, 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 who liked to drink. And I was kind of like this, uh, you know, I was an inside kid, right? I was a bit of a nerdy kid who uh, was scared of guns. And, uh, and I, you know, it felt like the one thing that we had in common when I was a kid was that I was just fascinated with gambling, right? I loved going to the racetrack and learning how to read the race form and how to understand the odds. I loved learning about poker. And, and so to me, games uh, were something that I could really geek out on. And it became something that my father and I really bonded over throughout my life. And so I think I ended up embracing it more and more because I felt like this is one thing that he thinks about me as cool, right? <laughs> like, I, I, like, I kind of like maybe fall short on a lot of the other categories, that, but on this one, I think he, you know, I can, I, I can um, uh, earn his respect a little bit. And and I've always really enjoyed games, you know, I've always enjoyed games and puzzles. And so, you know, gambling is just one sort of expression of that. Um, but also the culture of gambling, I'm, you know, I, as a writer, you know, I, I look, I'm really interested in outlaw culture generally, right? Not just gambling, but just this sort of idea of like these kind of subcultures in America that like live just on the fringes of or on the other side of like law, of the, what's, of the law, right? And I think that that's always fascinated me to a certain degree. And, the world of the gambler is one of those, right? That's kind of steeped in its own language and its own lore. And, um, and uh, it's one that I'm just really drawn to. And so while, yeah, I like to gamble, like I'm also just super fascinated with the world of gamblers, like people who make their living that way. And um, as a writer, that's definitely a place that I've spent a lot of time. But on, if I'm being perfectly honest, I feel like a, a big part of why I've ended up writing about gambling is because when I first started <laughs> writing, I wanted to be a sports writer, but there were so many people writing about sports or better than me is that I kind of figured out that like, hey, here's a thing that not a lot of 
people know about that I know a lot about. So maybe this is a place where I can like, you know, land stories and land pitches. Cause you know, when you're a freelancer, you eat what you kill. So um, that's kind of how I ended up in this lane. So you worked over on the book uh, over the course of five years, including for a year while living with your family in hot springs. Can you break down how you spent your time uh, over the, those five years? Yeah. I mean, we try, at first I tried to write the book from New York and uh, you know, I was working with, people in Arkansas were helping me with research and I would fly down every few months. And I just, at a certain point realized like that that was not going to work. And um, we had a baby on the way. And so, you know, my wife took a year to leave from her job and we just decided to pack up and move to Arkansas for a year so I could finish it. And uh, we rented a, like a big old Victorian house on an acre of land on top of a hill, beautiful old house. And um, we were just down the street from the vapors. I mean, every day I would get up and walk you know, I'd walk down uh, Park Avenue past the Vapors downtown to uh, Collective Coffee to sit and write, you know, for the day. And, uh, and um, you know, being New Yorkers, you know, we liked walking. So, like, it was cool to be in what they call Uptown in Hot Springs because we could walk everywhere, you know. We walked everywhere we went. And, uh, and downtown Hot Springs is a very walkable kind of place. And so I spent a lot of, you know, I spent, I spent a lot of that year um, – writing, but also, you know, continuing to do research and meeting people and interviewing people. And one of the cool things about being in Hot Springs was that I would meet people and interview them and then they would introduce me to other people, right? And then I'd interview those folks and I kind of would find leads or find stories just from being there and just chatting with folks that I would have never been able to do if I wasn't there. And it was also kind of cool just being, walking around in the shadows and the footsteps of these people I was writing about. I mean, honestly, it was really the right decision to move down there because I found the time I lived down there very inspirational, you know, found the story really came to me in a much richer way when I was in Hot Springs writing it than if I tried to write it from, you know, from the uh, desk at the library in New York. So were you writing and researching simultaneously? I mean, I, 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 like, I like to quantify things. Can you break down like <laughs> what percentage of the time you, you wrote versus researched? Well, look, this was my first book, right? So I kind of had to, I, I broke a few eggs making the omelet, right? I, I made a lot of mistakes as I went. This book took me five years, but it really didn't have to. <laughs> and if, if, I get, if, if I get the opportunity to ever write another book, I guarantee you it won't take, take that long because so much of that time was just me trying to figure out how to do this right. And I definitely also, I think I spent a lot of time doing research in a way that was really procrastination, right? I mean, research is fun and you can do it forever. It's fun to like dig into, and I, st I got on these tangents where I was trying to solve mysteries, you know, that my editor eventually had to kind of reel me in and say, no one cares, right? Nobody cares about this, right? Like you got to focus on the main story. But I would say that during the time I was in Arkansas, I would say that the balance was probably that I was spending more time doing research than writing at the front end. But, but once that year started to, you know, the end of that year started to creep up on me, I started to, you know, spend more time writing because my personal goal was to have a manuscript to submit by the end of the year. And, um, you know, I went months there without writing a page before I realized like, oh man, I gotta, you know, I gotta get to work here. And so then by the, you know, maybe the last half of that year, I was spending a lot more time writing than doing research, but the research never stopped. I mean, I've, I've told the story before, but like, you know, I, I was looking, I was reviewing um, page proofs for this book, you know, uh, last fall when like, I'm get, when other F, new FBI files were showing up and st new stuff that I'd never seen before. And I was like, call the editor, I called the editor. I said, we got to pause this because I just got a bunch of new stuff that I want to write into the book. I mean, it just feel like stuff like that just kept happening throughout the whole span of the five years. Um, and I'm sure that it'll keep happening. I mean, now that it's out, all these people want to email me all these great stories that they have <laughs> about those days. And I'm like, well, thanks a lot. It's not that useful to me anymore, but um yeah. But I wish I'd, I wish I'd met you five years ago. Uh, well, so filing freedom of information request with the FBI is, is notoriously um, Kafka-esque. Yep. Uh, you know, you, you'll, you'll do it and then wait and wait and wait. So what was your experience like? And, and, and also just talk about how important it was. I, I know it was a real uh, backbone to a lot of your reporting. It was. It was, it was absolutely essential. Um, and, uh, you know, the FBI, FBI files really helped me immeasurably in so many ways. I mean, so to give you a little sense of that process, I mean, I, I sort of filed my initial FOIA right after I had written the proposal for the book. And that would have been in 2000 and let me think about this, 15. And 
it took a good three years for me to get the bulk of those, the initial sort of bulk of those files. And so I, Dane Harris's file alone was like almost 4,000 pages. Wow. I've only seen maybe about, I've maybe only seen about 1,700 pages of that file. Um, and they'll still, they'll continue to send them to me. I ended up having to negotiate with the FBI. They have like a whole department that handles these kinds of requests. And I worked with a woman who worked with the FBI who negotiated with me over the scope of the request. And, you know, honestly, she was great. I mean, she got a sense of what my project was and what I was working on so that she could review the files and figure out what I needed and didn't need, right? So she kind of did this, like, was able to do this first cut for me because I, she spent a lot of time with me getting a sense of what the project was. And, and this honestly, is somebody you hired? No, this is a woman who worked for the FBI oh, because wow. they don't, they don't want to have to work on a 4,000 page request. They would rather you pare it down. And so in talking to them and negotiating with them, uh, you know, she said, let just talk to me about what your book is about and who is in it and what's it about. And that way she could go through the files because she was allowed to read them. Right. And she could figure out what might be useful to me and what might not be that way. She could just send me like 50 or hundred pages at a time. And I wouldn't have to wait till the 12th and never for 4,000 pages. But, uh, but it was, it, it did take forever, forever. And the first bunch of files that came to my mailbox, I literally jumped up and down for joy in the street at the mailbox when I had them. And then I went and opened them up and they were useless. They were useless. The first bunch of files I got were just, there was nothing in them. They weren't even the right year, right? For when my book was, I was just crestfallen. I was like, how many more years before the next one comes? But then they started to kind of trickle in after that. But one, but I, you know, I, as I'm writing this book, I came up with an idea for another book that I wanted to write. And so I immediately started filing FOIA requests just on the off chance that I might want to write this book. And I still haven't even received those. It's been years, right? So I, this is how you have to do it. Like if you want to use FOIA, uh, FBI files, you got to be several years ahead of the game, you know, to, to get your hands on those. And, and of the, the pages you got, what, what percentage uh, of them were redacted? You know, a lot's redacted, although, you know, if you provide the FBI with the names of people that you think might be in the files and you know are dead, then they will leave those names in there, right? So I kind of gave the FBI a list of names of people that I was interested in writing about that I knew were dead so they could leave at least those names in. Another thing that I was able to do over the course of my research was find other FBI files that were easy to get my easier to get my hands on that I could use to supplement the files I was giving the FBI. So one place I went was the Mary Farrell organization, which is a um, JFK assassination group. Then they have just a trove of FBI documents around the, F the JFK assassination, and they have tons and tons of unredacted files. I don't know how they got them. But, you know, I paid them a bunch of money for access to their archive, and I didn't care much about all the JFK stuff, but because they had these just, you know, these reams and reams of files on a lot of these organized crime figures from, you know, 1957 and 1963, well, that's a pretty good period for me. And I was able to find stuff on Dane and stuff on Hot Springs and all these files. And so that allowed me to connect some dots too that maybe wouldn't have been in Dane's file or Oni's file, right? Um, because what I found that was kind of interesting was that the, the files that were written by the FBI agents in Arkansas were not as good as the files that were written by FBI agents in say Chicago or New York who were writing about Hot Springs, right? Like the intel they were getting on Hot Springs from crime figures in Chicago was much better than what the folks in Arkansas were getting. You know, I don't know why, but you know, the Arkansas the files that were written by the folks in Arkansas were very scant and, uh, and they painted a much different picture than, than when you read the, the, the files on illegal gambling that were being written by larger FBI offices. So that helped me a lot too, to realize like I had to kind of do an end around to get the good stuff there. So you, you do just a really impressive job of controlling the narrative, providing just the right amount of, of context Thank you. about how, you know, the events of Hot Springs were connected to say the politics of Arkansas, uh, of the country as a whole and, and the mob. In my experience, the only way you can pull that off is it, to, to thread that needle is by doing a ton of research and then leaving most of it on the cutting room floor. Um, you had a great Substack email newsletter that you did while you were living in Hot Springs where it seemed like you were sharing some of those stories. So what of those kind of B-sides from your newsletter, uh, now also the Arkansas Times, was lucky enough to publish a, a great story that you did on on the hot springs wire that connected uh racetracks across the country with bookmakers and hot springs so uh, of the stuff that didn't make it in the book like what are some top kind of b-sides that stick out to you yeah and apologies to anybody that subscribes to that newsletter that, that i haven't updated in a while but i've gotten a little bit 
busy with. <laughs> with but it's it. all online, so you should plug. What's the URL? Yeah, yeah, it's um, well, it's a uh, David sub David Hill dot substack dot com. I think is the URL, but you can also find it at my website, davidhillonline.com. But it's called Letter from Hot Springs, and um, and yeah, I can I I plan on continuing to write those. I mean, you know, in the end, what I had to cut out was anything that didn't connect directly to one of my three main characters. And that's a lot. That was a lot of stuff. I mean, in earlier drafts of the book, I really went on some tangents that I thought were super interesting and fascinating, but that took me too far afield from the three main characters. One element of the story that I think really gets too short of shrift in the book because of that was to really flesh out the story about what was going on on Malvern Avenue with the African-American community in the second ward in Hot Springs. And, you know, that was a part of the story that I thought was equally fascinating, but too seldom connected up with, you know, um, with Dane's story or with Hazel's story. And so that's why I think of some of the stuff that I had there didn't kind of make the final cut. Um, in particular, and I've told this in other interviews before, I, I really thought that this, uh, there was kind of a subplot to the whole story about how, like, what was happening in Hot Springs had this, like, reverberating effect around the country, right? That, that as the Justice Department was shutting down illegal gambling operations all around America through the McClellan committee, Hot Springs grew, right? Hot Springs' growth and success during that period of time was kind of at the expense of other communities where um, corruption was being rooted out and the Justice Department was locking gangsters up. And what that was creating around the country was like kind of inner scene mob wars that were happening because these mobsters were losing their turf and they were fighting over a smaller and smaller piece of the pie while Hot Springs was growing. And so while people in Hot Springs were kind of like patting themselves on the back about how they're able to have this great, you know, illegal gambling operation without a lot of bloodshed, it's kind of like the old trolley, the philosopher trolley problem. Like, well, there is bloodshed, right? <laughs> it is creating bloodshed in other communities. And so one place that in particular where that was happening was Newport, Kentucky, um, which is near Cincinnati, which was also a wide open gambling town that was shut down, you know, by the um, Justice Department and by sort of reformer, um, reform candidates who kind of took control of the government there. And there were these, there was this gangster named Screw Andrews, who was a, um, a white uh, gangster from the Midwest who lost a lot of his operation. And so what he did was he went into the black community in Cincinnati and started taking over the numbers operations there by just killing the leaders of those, um, the leaders of those operations, just murdering them and taking them over. And so there's a story about a guy named Skeets Coleman, who was one of the leaders of the uh, an important uh, gambling boss in Newport, Kentucky and Cincinnati, who l flees to get away from Screw because he's afraid he's going to murder him. And he comes to Hot Springs to hide out and Screw trace, chases him all the way to Hot Springs and murders him right in his car, right in front of Dane Harris's house. And um, so that kind of war spills over into the streets of Hot Springs. And I wanted to tell that story because I felt it was important to show how there is violence that is happening as a result of what's happening in Hot Springs. But in the end, it just felt like it was too many names and too many, too much exposition that needed to be told that didn't really connect with our main characters and it ended up getting cut out. But hopefully one day, if we ever do it like a TV show of this book, I can get that stuff back in there. <laughs> yeah, totally. I, I, that was one of the things that I kept thinking, like this is a very cinematic book. And I mean, I guess you're slightly disadvantaged because Boardwalk <laughs> Empire covered similar ground, but, uh, have you optioned it yet? Yeah, I did option it. And, um, you Wait. know, fing fingers crossed we'll get it made. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it was really cool how much interest there was in it. And, you know, I honestly think that one of the things I kept saying to folks about it is that, like, if you watch Boardwalk Empire, Boardwalk Empire ends right as this book begins, right? Oni Madden becomes a character in Boardwalk Empire at the end of Boardwalk Empire. Like, I remember watching that show and getting excited when they started first talking about Oni because I was like, oh, cool, maybe they'll talk about Hot Springs in this show. And then the show ends, so like, in some ways, this is a good, you know, continuation of that story that people seem to be very interested in when they watched Boardwalk Empire. Yeah, well, and, you know, by with the story of your grandmother, you get to get into class issues, and, uh, you know, maybe they could, they could flesh out some of the, the African-American community stuff you're talking about. So we're about halfway through. This is uh, just a reminder for folks to, uh, to ask questions in the chat. Um, there's a good one from Mary Ann there now. Uh, can you describe the relationship between Hot Springs and the rest of Arkansas during this period? Arkansans of the era thought of it as a den of sin and inequity, and the place couldn't have flourished without patrons from around the state. Yeah, it was a very antagonistic relationship. And 
people in Hot Springs were totally frustrated that that they could not. The only reason that they couldn't legalize gambling in Hot Springs was because the rest of the the rest of Arkansas was so opposed to it, right? And so it really did feel like I think to those folks that they were um, kind of in an island. You know what I mean? That they were that they were kind of surrounded on all sides by folks who really didn't care about the fact that this was their bedrock business, right? That this was their livelihood. And so, um, so yeah, it was definitely a, 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 it was definitely an antagonistic relationship between Hot Springs and the rest of um, the rest of the state. And I think we see that also with some of the drama that plays out between the state legislators, who are also kind of you know jockeying to try to pass a bill through the legislature, and um, and um, Hugh Byram Hurst, who is the um, the member from Hot Springs and from Garland County, and his you know how much he had to really in the end just pay people off to get them to vote for this because he could not get his, you know, the, the, his fellow members of his caucus to support the bill until he just started paying them, you know? So um, I, I think that that was a, that was, but, but when, one of the things I kind of realized as I was learning the story was that where the, when people knew the tables were turning on hot springs was when the churches in hot springs started to allow the ministers from other churches in the state to come and preach against gambling in the pulpit, you know, you know the churches had the churches had always kind of tacitly supported gambling in Hot Springs, and provided a bit of a bulwark there. You know what I mean? That like that people couldn't get in because if you couldn't get in through the parishioners and the churches by telling them this is a sin, you weren't going to get in. But that's when I think in the 1960s when people realized like, oh man, they saw the writing on the wall. And I write about this a little bit in the book, is that local churches in Hot Springs who used to never preach against gambling we're suddenly allowing preachers to come in and talk about gambling. And, and that was the, that was the sort of crack in the, in the levee, so to speak. So of course, sort of the quick pitch for this book is it's all about uh, this forgotten gambling Mecca that was Las Vegas before Las Vegas. So, mm -hmm. you know, have you talked with people or thought through now that you know so much about this period about what might've happened in hot springs had gambling not been shut down? I think it's, to me, it's clear that Hot Springs would have become Las Vegas. I mean, if you think about it, and this is only because I've spent so much of the last five years tr with my brain kind of existing in that period of time, right? Like where I had to really transport myself to this. And you think about it, if you were if you were alive back then, it would have been really hard to imagine Las Vegas becoming what it is today. I even think that people at that moment, people like Meyer Lansky, who were investing considerable amounts of money in Las Vegas, didn't feel great about that choice, right? They were forced to do that because of because of the revolution in Cuba, right? Havana was where the mob was going to build their Monte Carlo, right? It was going to be Havana. That's where everything's at. So the revolution forced them to reevaluate. And they were, you know, ambivalent at best at putting that money into Las Vegas because it was just, it just did not seem like it made any sense that anybody would ever want to go there. And at the time, you know, even by 1957, I think I say in the book that like there was no sewer, you know, there was there were no street lights. It was just, it was such a backwater, even as they were building these casinos and creating the Las Vegas Strip. And uh, people were already reading the last rites on Vegas before it really ever began. Hot Springs, on the other hand, that, you know, in the late 50s and early 60s had millions of visitors coming to Hot Springs every year already. And it, if you ever go to Hot Springs, if you ever travel there, you'll see when you go downtown, there are these mammoth buildings everywhere. You know, there were even more before they all started burning down, but like there were these just huge hotels that were built. All those hotels were built in the early 1960s in anticipation of gambling being legalized in Hot Springs. They were gearing up for Hot Springs becoming this massive, becoming America's kind of gambling capital. And it didn't happen. And those hotels never really fill, filled up. We never got to see the kind of development that we would have seen if they had. And I truly believe that like that, what we, what, what you see in those kind of like large empty edifices downtown hot springs is the beginning only the beginning of what could have been in terms of how much that community could have developed if they'd have been the only you know legal gambling in america because hot springs is such a great place to visit regardless right i mean there's lakes and there's mountains and you know there's just it, there's so much lush you know land to see and it's it's temperate and it has everything las vegas didn't have except for proximity to los angeles they, you know it, it it was a place that already was considered a a a, 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 a a, a tourist destination. So all it needed to do was like make the gambling legal and they could have, you know, then the, the bank loans would have flowed in. Um, so yeah, I truly believe that like in that moment, there was a crossroads and Hot Springs chose, you know, or I should say Arkansas chose one path and Nevada chose the other. And I think that the money that got moved from Cuba to Las Vegas 
built that community built that sort of backwater into a truly international city with billions and billions of dollars in investment and you know something remarkable i mean for whatever you think about las vegas it is remarkable that people were able to build you know a city of over a million people in the middle of nowhere you know what i mean out of nothing there's very few examples in american history where we, where we were able to do that really to build such a place from the ground up like that in such a short a period of time and uh and so you know, like I said, that could have been, I believe that could have been Hot Springs. It's hard for us to imagine now because we think of Hot Springs as Hot Springs and Vegas as Vegas. But I think if you went back in time and looked at those two cities, you would have, had a, you would have handicapped that bet much differently. I feel like this is an essay that you need to write. <laughs> so uh, this is a weird time to be promoting a book. I assume that you've not traveled home uh, since the pandemic. What, what kind of reaction have you heard about from afar? Um, uh, has the book gotten in hot springs? And this is Pat Landis asked this question. Well, I mean, one of the difficulties is there's not really any bookstores in hot springs, right? I mean, there's like a books a million, I think, and they were slow to even get the book. So that's made it hard for people in hot springs to get their hands on it, which is really a shame because, you know, I feel like this is a book where if there's anybody in America that would want to read this book, I would imagine they live, would live in hot springs, but it's been, and the pandemic, I think, has also made it made it tough for folks to get their hands on the book but it's people are reading it and i've heard a lot of great things from people back back there about it and um you know like i haven't been down there um i wish that i could i'm eager to get down there to you know do some events or talk to folks or you know sign books or whatever um just to see people again you know i'd always imagined for years after we left hot springs that when this came out we were going to all go back down there it's going to be so much fun and get to reconnect with all the friends we made while we were down there and it's such a bummer that you know we weren't able to actually get to do that but, um, but no, it seems super positive. I've been very humbled and, you know, bowled over by, you know, how kind people have been about the book in Hot Springs. And, um, you know, honestly, that's, that makes it all worth it to me. If there was, I wouldn't care what anybody else in America thought, as long as people in Hot Springs were proud of it and liked it, that's all that really, that's all I would have needed to know that, to feel good about, you know, what I did. So, i uh weirdly growing up uh in in arkansas in the 80s I, I never went to hot springs my my relationship with the city is only as an adult when i've known it you know in the early aughts as sort of uh david lynchian branson and, and now it really kind of seems like it's on the come up there's mm -hmm. uh, a lot of uh you know promising new businesses lots of young people good arts organizations uh finally good restaurants and hotels and then of course oakland is uh uh, you know, after, um, you know, 15 years of this electronic games of skill, it now has legit casino gambling. They're building this giant yep. resort. Um, I mean, that, that is like mild criticism of your book is that in your, in your uh, epilogue, you, you mentioned that there's casino gambling, but you uh, sort of suggest that Hot Springs as, is a, a dying town. And mm -hmm. of course, relative to the, the you know, counterfactual that you just gave on what it could have been, it is. But right. uh, a questioner asked, you know, what, what your take on, um, on Hot Springs, especially uh, the, the gambling in Hot Springs today is. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it was difficult for me to include those parts in the epilogue that were there. And I, and, I, and I think that like after conversations with editors about it, I think what I realized was that it was important in the story that I was telling to end it in a certain way. And it was hard because there was a real discussion about how far into the future do we really want to go, right? Should like how much of a responsibility is there at the end of this book to talk about Hot Springs today, right? In 2019 or whatever versus ending the book where the book ends or how far into the into the future in the epilogue do we want to go and it was hard I, I i wasn't really sure because for me that the end of that book till to, to today is a spectrum right you, you just can't jump in history to 2020 and say and, th and then this is what happened right a lot of stuff happens between 1968 and 2020 and not all of it was great. I mean, I grew up in Hot Springs during its what I think was its nadir, you know? So while I agree with you that like Hot Springs is a great city and the year that we spent there was fantastic. And I, you know, and I, and I really hope that this book encourages more people to go there and visit there, but you're right. Hot Springs is definitely a, a, a city that's on the come up. And uh, I, I think that it's, um, it's, uh, it's like a, a, a treasure, you know? And, and it's definitely one of the, best things that Arkansas has to offer. And, and there's a lot of reasons why people should go there. 
when I was growing up there, it wasn't necessarily that way. It was when I grew up there, it was a city. It was really trying to find its way. You know, it was a city that it really had its identity stripped from it. It had the, you know, the, the rug pulled right out from under it. And it really was wobbling around trying to figure out what is it going to be. And, um, and it, there was a lot of capital flight and there was a lot of people that fled in those, in, in, you know, in those ensuing years through the 1970s into the 1980s. And so I kind of grew up in a hot springs and experienced a hot springs that was really different than the one that I experienced during the year that I lived down there writing the book. And I kind of wanted to give that full picture because the epilogue, I think, is not just telling the story of 2020 or whatever, 2019. It's telling the story of hot springs in the, you know, the years after uh, the book, after the, after the end of gambling. Um, but yeah, I think that, um, that uh, Hot Springs is fantastic. I have nothing bad to say about it. I mean, you know, our family was really, we, had, we were grateful a little bit. Most of that year we spent down there, we kind of looked at each other like, maybe we should just stay down here, right? This is pretty great. Like, um, you know, so we flirted with that idea for quite a while. I mean, it was, um, you know, it was just that good. And the people down there could not have been more welcoming and friendly to us. One thing that I did think was interesting, though, was that a lot of the, we made a lot of friends while we were in Hot Springs that were people who were not from Hot Springs. Right. right. They had moved there from other places and they had moved there as an adult and they brought their families there and they'd come there and started businesses or whatever. And I thought that was kind of interesting. Right. I mean, uh, so I think that like, while there are a lot of folks in hot springs who were there when I was growing up and are still trying to like, you know, keep, you know, building that community into what it is. There's also a lot of new blood that has moved there. That's really helped, you know, kind of spur that along. So I was really fascinated in your author's note. Uh, you say that there were, uh, people who declined to speak with you for fear of reprisal. I mean, the the events of, of the book took place 60 to 90 years ago, and mm -hmm. and the the major figures are all dead. So what can you talk about that? Well, I think that while a lot of the people that are the major events, while a lot of the major figures in the book are dead, their families are all still there, right? Mm -hmm. So when I say reprisals, I mean, maybe that word sounds a little dramatic and maybe that was intentional on my part, but <laughs> I don't think people were afraid of like getting killed <laughs> or those kinds of reprisals. I think people were afraid of like what, you know, if they tell me a story about a certain person, what that person's like grandson is going to say about them, you know? I mean, that's, or, or say to them for telling me that story. I mean, that's what I mean is that like, it's a small town, you know, and some of these families still all kind of live there. And you know, I think that people were nervous about sort of talking outside of school about somebody else, right? And I think that was what I kept running across was people thinking like, should I tell that story? Because somebody might not like that I told you that story and not so much like, you know, that's a secret I have to take to my grave or I'll get killed. It wasn't like that dramatic. Um, and I also think there were some people who like, you know, were truly like, you know, nervous about whether or not something that had been told to them in confidence, they should blab about too, even if the person was dead. So you know, I kept running up against that. And often I'd just say, look, I don't have to use your name in the book. If you want to tell me the story, I'll just keep your identity. You know, I'll keep your name out of it. And people say, yeah, keep my name out of that book. <laughs> <laughs> so the, another thing that I keyed in on, on your author's note is that uh, you said in certain instances, the counts of people that you uh, interviewed differed and yeah. you were left to decide, you know, who, who to believe. And in, in newspaper journalism, you know, you, you would say person A said X happened and person B right. said Y happened. And maybe you'd provide some context and let the reader decide. Uh, that's admittedly clunky. Um, you wrote in one of your letters from Hot Springs that you've been obsessed or you were obsessed while you're writing the book with questions of truth. Yep. So what, what form did that obsession take? I mean, from the very first day of me thinking about how to write this book, I totally was obsessed with this idea of truth, right? And what's true and, and how to represent these things. I mean, as, as someone who's writing a story, writing a book about something that I was not there to experience and, um, you know, couldn't have seen firsthand. I mean, you know, a lot of the stuff that I've written is like a journalist, a lot of the like long form stuff that I've written, I was, I wrote it, you know, and I was there first, you know, I was there firsthand to like experience these things and see them and write about my experience. And that's fairly easy to do, right? I'm writing about something that I saw with my own two eyes um, or I'm telling a story that somebody else told me. But with this book, it was going to be much harder because I wasn't there and a lot of the people I was interviewing weren't there either. Or maybe they heard about it secondhand or something. Or, But what I kind of started to learn as I, was, as I dug more and more into this was that there was no way to really wrap my arms around the truth, right? I mean, I think historians and even journalists sometimes will use like primary source materials and say, well, look, it's, it's one thing if you have you know, if you've got it on, um, you know, from like a primary source, meaning like if you've got it in like a police report or a court record or 
or even a newspaper account of something, then that is, you know, that is worth a lot more than if you've got something, you know, like a story that someone told you, like an or, you know, kind of an oral history. But all of those primary sources are just another version of oral histories. I mean, you know, these FBI files contradicted each other often, right? I just told you the story about how I'd read an Arkansas FBI report about something that happened, and I'd, I'd see a report from Chicago about the same thing that happened, but a completely different version of the events, right? Because they're talking to different people, or they have a different take on it. I mean, newspaper reports, reports too, like the Sentinel Record, the local paper in Hot Springs, they notoriously did not write about this stuff in the Sentinel Record. They didn't want to put this town's kind of dirty laundry out in front, out in front of the world, at least not for a while. They, that, that, that kind of, you know, that, that code of silence or whatever broke down at a certain point. They started writing about it more, but for during a certain, a lot of the years of this book, I couldn't find anything in the local newspaper to, you know, but I could find, or I'd find stories in the local newspaper that kind of whitewashed something that happened, but then there'd be a story in the Arkansas, you know, Gazette that gave a much more kind of, you know, different account of what had happened. So this is where it's like, if I just relied on the Sentinel record, um, I might've had a different idea of what had happened than if I read all the other papers in the state and saw how it was being covered in other places. So this is where like the intention of the people that were writing these things, whether it's police writing a police report or, you know, a journalist who's interviewing people for a story, it's hard to know what's true, right? Because people lie and people remember things wrong. People's memories are sometimes faulty. I mean, even where I was just talking to people in my own family who were telling me stories, you know, one person might've remembered it one way and one person might've remembered it a completely different way. And then it's like Rashomon where I have to figure out, I have to figure out what really happened by taking all these different versions and, you know, trying to apply my own sense of it to, to, to get to the bottom of what might be true. But I didn't really hold myself to that standard to say, well, you know, I'm going to have to like, have it a certain way in order to know, to go with it. I'm just going to write the story the way I want to write it and I'll put in the end notes where I found it and folks can take it or leave it. So Thomas Reardon asked you to talk about the big time entertainment that came to Hot Springs says that part of the book was pretty fascinating. I agree. I mean, yeah, everybody, everybody came to Hot Springs back then and it was really Dane Harris's vision, right? I mean, Dane, I think, truly believed that like you could lead with that. I think that was his big innovation when he kind of got into the casino business was we can lead with the entertainment and then the gambling will follow, right? That we can, we can pack them in by having, by, by spending a bunch of money on bringing a big name entertainer here and that'll pack in the audience and then those people will gamble. And he really invested a lot of money on the front end on paying big contracts to get people like, you know, Mickey Rooney or or, you know, or, or um, uh, the Andrews sisters, or, you know, he, he, he invested a lot of my Mitzi Gaynor to get all these big time names to come to Hot Springs. And, um, and it paid off. He was totally right about that, right? I mean, it, it, it gave the, na the Vapors real national cachet. And, um, and it brought in people from all over the state, but it also, you know, the locals also like to go there. And what it did more than anything, and I think what Dane was probably the most proud of was that it made people in Hot Springs feel special, right? The fact that they that that these entertainers would come to their little town and perform, or to or to or to premiere their big Broadway show, right? Or to do a TV show or whatever, made people from this town feel real special and feel proud of the fact that like Hot Springs was on the map. You know, I think that made people feel very cool. The same thing was going on on Malvern, you know, at the Cameo Club and at other clubs on the black side of town, where where you know there were a lot of African American entertainers who were coming and performing performing there, people who then kind of went on to very big, um, to, to, to build really big um, profiles for themselves in entertainment as well. You know, Ray, uh, Ray Charles and B.B. King, and, 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 and I tell a story in the book about Duke Ellington. I mean, you know, this, this made people in Hot Springs kind of swell with pride about the fact that like, these folks are coming here. They're coming here to perform for us, and they're coming here to perform in our town. And I think that it, 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 it I think it had people kind of, um, holding their heads up a little bit higher, right? About, and I think that was really something that Dane deserves a lot of credit for, that he really invested the money to make Hot Springs that kind of destination and not just a place, not just a place full of grind joints where people would come so that they could gamble their money, but really be a place that people would come to have the whole, to really, you know, have the whole package. And um, I think he saw that happening in Las Vegas, but he was able to do it in Hot Springs, you know, to great success. So Keith Ingram asks, what's your best guess as to who is responsible for the bombing of the vapors? It's a real <laughs> dramatic highlight of the book. Well, I mean, I think that I, look, in the book, I, I feel like I kind of point the finger pretty well at a couple of people. 
um, who I suspect did it, right? There's these, the guy who in the book I kind of set up as a real foil to Dane is this fellow Jack Digby, who was the police officer who gets involved in the gambling business. And, you know, he had a reputation in town for being, you know, pretty wily dude and um, a real bruiser. And uh, one of the things I learned when I got the DOJ records from, um, from the National Archives in College Park, Maryland was when I realized, well, that's when I learned that like, Sam Anderson, who was the lawyer, Marion Anderson's son, who was the law, Jack's lawyer and the lawyer for a lot of the like uh, rival gambling bosses. And Jack had fled to Atlanta right before the vapors got bombed. And they stayed in Atlanta until they were given assurances that they wouldn't be arrested if they came back. And the FBI and the Department of Justice were reaching out to them saying, we want to question you guys. And they're like, well, we're not coming back there. We're not going to talk to you until we know. So like they clearly set their alibi up and the DOJ's theory which they were never able to prove was that, you know, Digby had hired these guys from Chicago, who I talk about in the book, these two brothers that, that had been bombers in Chicago who, who were known for blowing up restaurants that FBI thought that they had um, hired these guys to come in and do the bombings while they kind of hit out in Atlanta. I'm not sure about the, that part of it. You know, that was their theory, but there were so many of these bombings that happened even in the after the vapors, right? There were attempted bombings that failed. There were some bombings that weren't even reported as bombings. And they kind of go on for years, right? And then there was the Roanoke Church fire as well. So I wouldn't be surprised if it was actually people local that were doing it. But one thing that's clear is that, you know, this gang of rival operators were almost certainly behind all of this. Um, and that this was sort of part their big strategy. I will say that I had heard from one person I interviewed, <laughs> that Dane had said, you know, to the end of his life that he believed his whole life that Jimmy Hoffa was, um, you know, out to get him and was behind every bad thing that happened to him in his life. And he really believed that the Hoffa had a lot to do with uh, what had befallen Hot Springs, not just with the bombings, but even with the Governor Rockefeller and everything that happened to the legislature. He, he really felt like Hoffa was the one trying to sabotage things in Hot Springs. And who knows? So we have a couple of uh, Bill Clinton related questions. Uh, TPG asks if you can, can, can provide some insights into how this period in Hot Springs potentially shaped a young Bill Clinton. And Sarah Degas wants to know if you can share anything about your conversation with Bill Clinton about Oh, that. great. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, I don't, I, so yeah. Um, uh, I, I, I wrote about Bill in the book because I felt like it was important. You could not write about it. I mean, he was there, you know, and his mother were there during this period of time. And honestly, Bill's mother, um, Virginia, she was a pretty, you know, she was a well-known character in a lot of these places. She was a regular at the Vapors, and uh, she loved to hang out there and and, uh, and 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 dance and gamble. And uh, she was known to, you know, gamble at the racetrack and at the clubs. And uh, she loved the, inter you know, the entertainment. And she w she liked the nightlife in Hot Springs. And in the book, I try to draw this like comparison between Virginia and Bill, and also um, Hazel and Jimmy because Jimmy and Bill were born on the same day and they had very similar circumstances in life, right? They were both, they had single mothers of, you know, um, abusive uh, fathers. And, uh, you know, I, I wanted to show that contrast because it's like, I didn't want everything to seem like, look, you know, the, the, everything that had happened here with Jimmy and Hazel, it could have been another way, right? Like, Virginia is a perfect example of somebody who was able to like kind of keep her shit together, right? And, um, and ends up raising a son who, becomes the president of the United States. And, you know, she herself lived a pretty great life and um, was, you know, became a real um, important uh, member of the community and beloved, you know, person in our community. So like, I wanted to show that contrast to show that like, you know, some of what's happening to Hazel is kind of her fault, you know, and I, I felt like that kind of showed that in a weird way. But also, I felt like it'd be weird to not mention Bill Clinton, because he was around when a lot of this was happening. And he's like the most famous person to ever come from Hot Springs. Um, he did call me after the book came out and I spoke with him for a while. He read the book and enjoyed it. And that was kind of a surreal experience getting like an email saying, you know, can you take a call from Bill Clinton in the next half hour? So, um, I, you know, so that'll be a, that'll be a, a story I'll tell my grandkids, I guess. But yeah, Bill Clinton called and he said he enjoyed the book and that was nice to hear. Uh, let's see. Someone asks uh, who your favorite character was aside from your grandmother. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, obviously, I like I said before, I have a lot of respect, you know, for Dane Harris after having written the book. I mean, in a weird way, I feel like he's 
a bit of an unsung hero for Hot Springs. I feel like he was a real visionary for the town. What I really appreciated about him was that he, you know, I think that this book in a lot of ways is about ambition, right? And it's about people who have these big ambitions, but then they fall short of them, right? That they, that they really try to swing for the fences and, and miss and, you know, they fail and they fail real hard, but that I think there's something beautiful about, ha about those ambitions. And in Dane's case, you know, his ambition was that he believed that Hot Springs could be a better, a better kind of a place. You know, it could, it could, it could serve such a greater purpose in terms of like, you know, being an important city culturally, being a, uh, an important city in, a, in, in sort of the, the fabric of, the, of, the, of American culture at that time. And he didn't see Hot Springs as just being like a little town in Arkansas that could have, you know, some dice tables. He thought that Hot Springs could be an American city, right? That could be like a world-class city. And um, he didn't want to sell it short. And I really appreciated that about him. And he bet, it, he bet the farm on that. He had an opportunity to take a piece of a Las Vegas club. You know, he was invited to go out there and take a piece of this, this casino in Vegas. And he turned it down because he said, I'm going to bet on Hot Springs. I think Hot Springs is the place that's going to that's going to win. I think Hot Springs is the future. I think that's the place people are going to want to go. If they can see what I see, you know, if they, they can see what I see about Hot Springs and they, they, they'll, they'll agree with me that like, this is a place that people should spend their time and their money and, and, and bring their families. And so, I don't know, as I got to learn more about Dane, I really started to feel a lot of respect for him. I feel like there should be a statue of him somewhere in Hot Springs because, you know, he really was somebody who really believed in it. And I think Hot Springs, people know a lot about, in Hot Springs, people know a lot about Leo McLaughlin. You know, he's a He's a fairly well-known, you know, figure in Hot Springs history, um, but not a lot of people know about Dane Harris. You know, he's not his story is not one that's been told very much. So, you know, I think that I'm I was glad to get to share some of that, and I do think that he he's an unsung hero. To shift gears a little bit, uh, I in the intro talked about all the publications you'd written for, but your professional career did not begin as a writer. You spent a number of years uh, union organizing. Mm -hmm. talk, talk about that experience. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's what I used to do. I was a union organizer for, union organizer for about 15 years. And so um, I just traveled around the United States, stirring up trouble, you know. I mean, I would go town to town and help people organize unions and take on their bosses. And uh, I did that from when I was about you know, 21 for about 15 years. And I think that was, um, you know, those were, that was a pretty exciting part of my life and uh, time in my life. And it was, um, it was work that I'm real proud of. Um, but I also think in a weird way, it set me up well for what I'm doing now, because a big part of what you do when you're, you, when you're an organizer is you learn to listen to people and you learn to get people to talk and tell you their stories. I mean, most of what I did was go, into towns I'd never been in before and knock on people's doors and get them to invite me into their home. And then I'd ask them to tell me their life story. Right. And then I'd sit there and listen. And I did this in places. I did this in the North and the West. I did it in Canada. I did it all over the South, you know, all over America. And I got to hear stories from, you know, immigrants and, you know, African-Americans and white folks. And it, it, it was like, you know, there's no better education for somebody who wants to be a storyteller than to, you know, spend a decade traveling around America, letting people tell you their stories. And so I really am grateful for that time because I feel like it helped me learn a little bit about how to tell, tell people stories and also how to get people to tell me their stories too. Um, but yeah, I, I, I spent a lot of time <laughs> as a union organizer and I still care a lot about the labor movement and organized labor. And I'm an officer in the National Writers Union now, so I'm trying to continue to carry that forward. Um, but, uh, but one day maybe I'll write a book about some of the wild the wild times I had uh, back in the early aughts organizing unions. And what what does your work with the writers union look like? Well, I'm on the board, and I um you know we, we are trying to organize right you know we I, the National Writers Union is a union of freelance writers, right? So we're trying to figure out how to organize freelancers in a in you know in the world today that's um, increasingly turning to um, independent contractors and precarious workers in the gig economy. I think it's more important than ever for us to figure out. I'm a freelance writer, right? I make my living as an independent contractor. It's important for us to figure out how how do you uphold standard, you know, raise standards, and how do you um, how do you um, sort of challenge uh, the de a rapidly rapidly declining standards in a world where you don't have a workplace, you don't have you know coworkers, and you don't have a lot of um, legal rights um, to organize. And so it's been it's challenging, but you know, I feel like I'm working with a lot of great 
freelance writers in the writers union to figure some of this stuff out. And um, it's, uh, you know, if I had more free time, I'd probably be, we'd be more successful, but so many of us have to uh, <laughs> earn a living writing that it's, 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 it's a tough project, but I've been working, I've been on the board for a few years there now. And, um, and, uh, and I would encourage anybody that's watching this, that's a um, freelancer to check us out and join the union. <laughs> Thanks for All right, well, with that, I, th I think we're out of time. Uh, thanks so much to the Clinton School of Public Service for hosting and, and for Dave for his time. Uh, the holidays are coming up. We encourage everyone to buy many, many copies of this excellent Please. book. And to just that's, <laughs> that's a great gift for every member of your family. So thanks so much, uh, Dave Hill. Uh, check out the book if you hadn't already. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. And thanks to the Clinton School. This has been great.